really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. <clears throat> Look, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, I'm not uh, sort of a deep expert in terms of income inequality, but I want to give you my kind of thoughts in terms of more about the consequences of inequality, the different uh, facets of it that we see in New Zealand, and what does it mean in terms of our politics and our policies. Um, we'll probably pick up the policy stuff in question and answers, and I'll probably sort of focus on the big picture stuff in my presentation. And I guess when I think about inequality, the real, uh, real impact of it is around the consequences of inequality. Um, and what I'm seeing at the moment is, around the world, is the impact of inequality on political change. Um, when I look at the orange buffoon in America, when I see Brexit in, uh, in the UK, I think those political changes are a direct result of the inequalities that have accumulated over a long period of time and have spilled over into this incredible amount of anger and angst. But more than that, I think the, the key message for me is that the people who feel like they've been left behind, the people who feel dispossessed, are now the majority of voters. And they're very polarized. And in those two uh, statements is probably what defines inequality for me. There, is, there will always be some form of inequality, but when they're the majority of the population or the majority of voters, and they feel like there is no way for them to bridge the divide, uh, you do get some pretty big consequences. And the social consequences that we see in um, the US or the UK for international context, I think is, is very much around the kind of the regional divide, the rich versus poor, the educated versus the uneducated. In parts of the US, if you have high school or less education, your real, real incomes have gone backwards for a number of decades. So you know, you, you see your quality of life has in fact worsened for a number of decades. No wonder people are angry. For New Zealand, I think it's really around the sources and the concerns that we face. For me, one of the big concerns is very much around regional inequality. When you look at in income inequality, it's as much about what's happening across the country versus what's happening within regions. And at the very localized level of the communities that we live, uh, that's where a lot of those inequality stories are actually being played out. What we find, for example, is that across, our, uh, across the country we have relatively stable inequality. But big inequalities in places like Auckland and Wellington, where both very high skill and low skill jobs are possible, and very low income inequality in the provinces, because everybody's poor. Then we've got issues like immigration, where I think the inequalities in terms of what people perceive in terms of the assets and the infrastructure that's available to them versus what's available to newcomers, who they feel like are not paying for those assets. I think this is going to be really big issues and one of the things that's going to really spill over in terms of the consequences of the political and economic discussion we'll see over in, uh, in coming decades. Housing is probably the biggest source of inequality in New Zealand. When you look at after housing cost income differences or expenditure differences, housing is the thing that's driving the biggest wedge between different parts of New Zealanders. And we know that this has been a major failing of successive governments for the last 30 years. We have lived through 30 years of neglect when it comes to housing. The issue that we're dealing with is absolutely a crisis. I don't care what measure of affordability you use. It doesn't matter who the Minister of Housing is, even if we have a Minister of Housing. The reality is that housing is probably the biggest challenge that faces us in terms of inequality and the consequences for people's access to security, ability to stay in a community, educate their kids, and a whole bunch of other things. When I look through a lot of the detail, the thing that gets me is I think the kinds of policies that we have pursued in the last 30 years, whether it's around welfare, whether it's around housing, whether it's around social housing, what's been missing is a sense of empathy. We don't actually like people who are poor. We don't want to look after them. They're dough bludgers. They don't deserve it. Only if they pull themselves up by the bootstraps, they'll be fine. That is the narrative that defines so much of our policy now that I worry that we will not be able to get on top of it. So we can do a whole bunch of stuff around policy because we know what kind of policies work, what kind of policies are effective. We have plenty of evidence. We're able to do those kinds of things. But I don't think you can do that without empathy. And because it's an election year, I should tell you what I think in terms of voting. I can't tell you which party to vote for because they're all feckless. But, <laughs> <clears throat> but at least vote on values, not on policies. In an MMP environment, Policies cannot be delivered on, but you can hold your po uh, politicians to account on values. Um, just understand that when you talk to your local MPs, if you do talk to your local MPs. I want to give you a little bit of context in terms of why you should take everything I say with a huge amount of skepticism. 
<laughs> experts don't know much. Um, if anything, the last decade has proven that we know far less than we thought we did. Uh, but part of the reason why we don't understand a lot of this stuff is because our models, our understanding of the economy hasn't captured all the big stuff around inequality, around debt, around housing. We simply have ignored too much of the economy, of the real lived experiences of people, to make sense of things. So much of what I did, particularly in my job um, as an economist, as a, um, a market economist, was really focused on things like forecasting the economy and making money for my clients. So I used to work at Goldman Sachs, and my job was to try and predict the next number that was going to be printed so then we could play the foreign exchange market and make millions of dollars. And I was bloody good at it, until I wasn't. <laughs> So essentially, if you think back to what sort of models we use, we look at history to try and understand how things work. And that, by and large, worked really, really well until the global financial crisis hit. After the global financial crisis, all the models broke down. They broke down because history was not repeating. What we saw was in, the, in history, those gray, the gray shaded areas, every economic recovery in New Zealand since the 1960s, and the blue line is what happened in this cycle. This is completely unlike every other recovery we have experienced. What we've gone through in the last decade is new. It is different this time. There's a whole bunch of unknown unknowns that are affecting what's going on. And this has questioned what do experts really know, but more importantly, what sort of models and what sort of questions we ask of our models. And I don't have the answers. The reason why I went into public policy research and all the other stuff that I do is because I wanted to learn more. I wanted to expand the kind of questions that I asked of myself to understand how society worked. And the, some of the big issues that came up for me was very much around the regional inequality, very much around housing, because they were the two big tangible things that I thought I could contribute to. But I think you guys can probably think of a whole bunch of other topics where some of these unknown unknowns exist. I call this the hedgehog chart. It's kind of like uh, the prickles of a hedgehog, right? This is, if any of you have seen my presentations before, I show this all the time because I make fun of the Reserve Bank with this. <laughs> and it's much easier to make fun of somebody else than yourself. Um, so those are the Reserve Bank's forecasts in the dotted line. And in the black line is what happened. We've got this incredible bias to thinking that we're going to go back to some kind of historical norm. And it's all, there's always this expectation that we, things are going to go back to normal. Things are going to go back to normal. It hasn't happened yet, but it will except they've been wrong for 10 years. They've got one job and they've gotten it wrong for 10 years. It's not because they're not doing a great job, they're not working really hard, it's because we're still using the old models, our old ways of thinking. We're still not asking the fundamental questions. And what that tells me is our experts are still stuck in a time warp. They're still stuck in the 890s, they're still thinking about the economy in a much more traditional, very restricted mathematical sense, rather than in a much wider sense that includes these much fuzzier, much harder to quantify things like in income equality. But for me, income inequality is kind of a red herring. What really matters is equity. What really matters is uh, equity across many different things, because our life is not defined just by incomes. You know, my income expectations might be very different for a very good life compared to yours, and that's absolutely fine. But somewhere in there, there is an idea of equity that I think is missing. But I think experts are really failing at this, and this is why we see the relevance of experts fading, not just in New Zealand, but globally. And I think we are going to see that continuing because academia is disengaged. We see the experts who are available are essentially talking heads like myself and people from banks. And you know what? We're not that good. So we have to think very hard about who's going to fill that void. Because in the absence of evidence-based good conversation, it will be filled by sloganism and other stuff. For me, a really big wake-up call was Brexit. And the reason I say that is because Brexit was so unexpected for me. How many of, of you in this room expected Brexit to happen? One person. You expected Trump to win too, right? Well, yeah, the same. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, right? So in this room, only one person expected it to happen. Yet it did happen. What does it tell us? We still don't want to believe that our society could be this divided, that our society could be so balkanized across so many different uh, dimensions. And when I look at the, uh, the surveys and the polls that happened around the UK, around the Brexit, uh, and what was really interesting for me was where the, those gaps were, where those divisions were in the, in the community. And essentially what this chart shows you in the pink is those who wanted to leave, and the blue are the ones who wanted to stay. So if you had less education, high school or less, you wanted to leave. If you're older, you wanted to leave. If you're living in the provinces, you wanted to leave. The divisions that we see are massive. And not only did we see that people wanted to leave versus stay, but the, the views were, in fact, really polarized. 
This is really important because what we're seeing here is that massive inequality of expectations, massive inequality of the dividends of economic growth of the last 30 years, the inequality in terms of representation in national conversation and all of those bits and pieces. But the div divisions we're talking about is not simple as saying it's a difference of income. It's actually in, across many different dimensions where people are sensing a loss of hope. There is a loss of optimism that they do not think that the optimism that we see for our country, that national narrative that we might have, applies to them. And I think that those kinds of worries are also very real for New Zealand. When I go to places like Gore, and I have a really fun job, I get to go to places like Gore. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with Gore. Um, it's pretty quiet and cold, much colder than Wellington. But what I have noticed in going to Gore over a number of years is the feelings against Auckland, for example, have changed for dislike and a joking reference to Jeffers to a visceral hatred. This is not, this is not, you know, I'm not saying this lightly. This is, this is, this is not normal. These, we're all New Zealanders and yet we've got this incredible feeling of division that those guys are stealing from us. They're taking what we should have. There is a real sense that this is a zero-sum game and places like, uh, like Auckland are growing at the expense of the provinces. So when I look at these divisions, what I'm seeing is a polarization of society, that, that middle ground where we agreed on stuff, that's really falling apart. And instead, we're shouting at each other from the sidelines of whatever divide we might choose, whether it's young versus old, homeowner versus renter, urban versus rural, rich versus poor. All of those divisions are now becoming far more polarized. And in those kinds of circumstances, it's much harder to have conversations that are constructive and reach a consensus. Because you're coming from these very ideological, uh, very strongly held viewpoints, very, very difficult to change. But <clears throat> while you know, most people need Prozac when they listen to me talk, <laughs> but I want to tell you that the context, the global context, is actually very optimistic. The world is a much better place than it has ever been, and New Zealand is a much better, much better place than it has been. Uh, while we might have roast in the glasses of what happened in the 1960s, you know what? It was a bit shit compared to now. It really was. We are in a much better place, but we should be ambitious to be much better. And I think that's, what, that's where my anger is, that's where my challenge is. The reason why we focus on challenges is not to celebrate the successes that we have, but to say that we can do so much better with relatively small changes. I think that's where the opportunities are. But I, I show this chart because I think if you look at the context of how much progress we've made globally, in that um, bottom shaded area is the number of people living in abject, well, extreme poverty. In the 1800s, over 90% of people in the world lived in extreme poverty. Today, it's less than 10%. The progress is undeniable. This is huge, right? In every metric in terms of child mortality, maternal mater mater uh, mortality, um, how long we're living, how tall we are because we don't have malnutrition, um, how long we're living, all of those things have improved. So there's a whole bunch of things where we are doing much better as a, as a population, much better as a world. Uh, but within that are the challenges and the opportunities for us to do much better. And Amy, you asked me to talk about income equality, so I wanted to throw one chart in there of that. <laughs> and I think it's for context. I think when people talk about income inequality, it, the, the debate becomes very heated around the measures that he use. I get sick of that. That's a, that's a conversation for boffins. And you know what? It doesn't achieve anything. But the real story of in income inequality in New Zealand, this is a, almost a 100-year picture of in income inequality in New Zealand. Let the experts argue about the detail of the data and the methodology. But essentially what happened was we had a lot of income inequality. And then we had some very progressive policies around equity that really happened in the post-war era, where we really, really wanted to make a change. And that was the period of nation building that happened in New Zealand. And if you look at the physical infrastructure that's in New Zealand or the social infrastructure, by and large, that was all built in that era. So the greatest generation made the biggest investments and the biggest sacrifices for future generations. So we kind of use that, that, that sort of mentality, that value system, to really kind of build a much fairer New Zealand. And income equality did fall, and it stayed low pretty much until the 1980s. Not all of those policies were sustainable, right? Uh, those of you who have gray hair will remember that things were pretty frightening, right? There was a whole bunch of things in terms of import licenses, restrictive policies, work sinks. You know, people just had jobs in the railway and the post office. They didn't actually work. It was just hidden, right? But at least there was, that was the form of welfare that we had. But that we, there was a social license to operate that model. 
except we didn't have the financial license to operate that model. So something broke in the 1980s. But then we had this big shift. Not only do we shift the financial model, we also shifted the social model. And that's when we had the big one-off increase in inequality, pretty much, through that economic reform period. And I think a lot of the reforms were necessary, but not all of them. We went from an irresponsible socialist country to an irresponsible capitalist country. So we went from one extreme to the other, but really there is a middle ground where you can do both. I think we still think about economics and policy as somehow a zero-sum game, that it's one or the other. Either you are looking after those who are unfortunate or you have a strong, efficient economy. Actually, those two things go hand in hand. And in fact, that is what's missing in a lot of our conversation. But essentially, if you look at what's happened in the last 30 years, you know, you can quibble about the numbers, but essentially we've gone sideways for 30 years. But that's a damning indictment, right? We've had 30 years of economic growth and no progress on in income equality. We have done nothing in terms of being able to bring that distribution closer together. We haven't been able to upskill people on low incomes. Uh, we have seen incomes of uh, higher income people just move away from people in the, in the middle. And we haven't done enough when it comes to our welfare policies to try and bridge those gaps. All of those things go hand in hand, but we have chosen not to do this. And when I say we very deliberately rather than the government, because the government does not exist in isolation. We've had many different political parties, many different ideologies. They have reflected what society wanted. I'd like to point the finger at the baby boomers. I think they reigned over the longest period of policy neglect in New Zealand. On their watch, we let go what it took, what took us many decades to achieve. So that is what this income inequality tells us, that we went through this long period of time where we made significant investments to try and keep income inequality low. We had a one big of increase in the 1980s, and we have never been able to resolve that. And we have chosen not to do anything for the last 30 years. But when I look at the stuff that's happening in the background, why we haven't made some of these changes, they're actually much slower moving structural stuff. A lot of the reason is because we're seeing these big differences across regions, within regions, and a lot of that is because of changing nature of work, the change in nature of the economy, right? I was talking to somebody the other day, and they go, oh, New Zealand's backbones in the rural economy. Bullshit, right? Of course it's not. It hasn't been for a very long time. We have lots of natural assets. That's absolutely true. We have lots of exports that are driven by the natural economy. But when it comes to jobs and livelihoods, by and large, they're urban jobs. Right? A hundred years ago, a third of our jobs were in the primary sector. Today, most of our jobs are in the services economy. And those services jobs are more likely to be either very highly skilled or low skilled, which kind of explains why incomes have become polarized. And also, they're more likely to be in cities. So people are moving into the, into the urban centers, and people who are left behind in the provinces quite often can't make that mobility, can't access those opportunities that are in the cities. So hidden beneath this kind of story of economic change, is kind of the driver of why income inequality has persisted for so long and why I don't think income inequality left to its own devices will get any better. Because the economic changes that we're seeing today are only going to speed up over time. And the reason why it's going to speed up is, of course, because of technology. We all know this, right? Um, how many of you in this room don't have a smartphone? Anybody? Thank you, madam. There's usually one person. I can rely on one person to not have it. <laughs> The first time I asked this question 10 years ago, I had to ask how many people had a smartphone, right? In 10 years, it's become completely pervasive for everybody to have, 99% of the population to have um, a smartphone. But if you think about how quickly this technology has come through, it is really rapid, right? So the iPhone is 10 years old. Can you imagine that it's only 10 years old? It feels like it's always been there, right? It's, been such a, it's now such a ubiquitous part of our lives, perhaps a little bit too much. Um, but you look at, if you go back to uh, landlines, that took nearly 50 years to become mass penetration. People had waiting lists to get a landline. Many months sometimes. They literally strung you know, cables to come and come to your house. And then you had the, the home computer, which took about 17, the internet 13, and the smartphone 7. Every new successive technology is coming through quicker and quicker. And that also means that industries are being disrupted quicker and quicker. Regions that had a specialty, the regions that had a reason for it to exist, are disappearing quicker and quicker. Our skills are becoming obsolete quicker and quicker. So when you think about the drivers that are going to create change, our currency in the economy, our currency to be employable, to, to earn good money, 
all of these things are changing really rapidly. So our ability to get resilience in terms of being able to access retraining, education, safety nets, all of those things are in fact going to become more important because change is going to be so, more, so much more rapid and so much more concentrated. This is where the biggest risk is in terms of where income inequality is and inequality in general is in New Zealand. These things are going to be busted open even wider because we know that economic change is going to speed up and our ability to respond to it hasn't gotten any better. Um, the urbanization story is another that's one of those really big stories in terms of where the divide is in New Zealand. Um, I don't think we talk about this enough. The difference between growing up or being born in a place like Cairo versus being born in Auckland is massive. Where you're born in New Zealand matters to what sort of life chances you'll have. And I'm ashamed to say this because when we think about the New Zealand psyche, our culture, the narrative that we tell ourselves of that fair go, that as long as you work hard, you'll have access to the same opportunities, is not true. And therein lies the perpetuation of some of the inequalities that we see that are only likely to expand over time unless we take active steps to make some of those changes. We know that with globalization, we're going to see some big shifts as well. Um, we will continue to see uh, significant markets for New Zealand's exports, right? Um, you know, we will continue to pollute our waters and degrade our environment because we want to grow more cows and uh, milk more things. Uh, we still haven't, I don't even know what. <laughs> I'm not very agricultural. <laughs> I went to Lincoln University, but you know, I saw the cows as I drove in. Um, we've got this very industrial mindset when it comes to the economy we're still focused on the idea of growing more stuff rather than being more profitable. As a country, we have a real big problem with that, but most countries do. This is not new, to, new or unusual. But the story of globalization is one where we know that globalization's speed has been exceptional in the last century, um, just like a lot of the economic progress that we had seen. Uh, so AD1, the center of the global economies of the Silk Road, by the 1950s is over the Atlantic. That's the colonization, rise of the Western world, industrialization. Over the next few decades, it's going to be over the, over the top of China, right? That's the rise of Asia that's coming through. That's an opportunity for us in that new markets that are coming through that's very close to New Zealand. But at the same time, we know that's going to continue to take away a lot of the low-skilled jobs that have no reason to be in New Zealand. But we have no plan to move these displaced people into something constructively. What, what is going to, we know the impact is going to be far more intense in the provinces than in the urban centers because the kinds of jobs that are there are more mechanical, more easy to be exported to low labor cost regions, da di da. But this globalization story is going to remain very important for New Zealand because we will continue to want to trade with these countries and there will always be new countries that are lining up to both buy our goods but also to take away some of those low skilled, unskilled jobs from New Zealand. So we're going to see that push pull continue doesn't matter what happens with TPPA, doesn't matter with any of that stuff. That might speed it up, but the story of globalization is not going to stop. And because of the relentless force, I think we will continue to see this as being a source of disruption and a source of some of the inequalities that we see in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. The other inequality that exists in New Zealand, of course, is generational. We know that there is this massive age, massively aging population. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, we all get older but we're going to have a hell of a lot of wrinkly people compared to young people soon, right? We know that we've made promises that we haven't paid taxes for, we haven't saved for, we haven't funded. We have unfunded promises that are essentially liabilities on future generations of young people. And the only way to describe it is we have stolen from our children and grandchildren. We pretend like we have deserve the entitlements that we have because we pay taxes. Any of you who feel that, let me tell you, you haven't paid enough taxes. That's the problem. We haven't paid enough, we haven't saved enough, we haven't done enough. And that is why the generational gap is so important. We know that from a voting perspective, older people vote a lot more. And right now that is, going to, that is a very big part of the patterns of voting that we see. But we know into the future, the millennials, in terms of sheer numbers, are the biggest group of people in the population. If they actually bother to vote, I think we could really take you guys, take, take the boomers on. That is not a constructive thing. It is not constructive to say that we're going to pit one generation against another. It's not constructive to say that the boomers stole from their children and grandchildren. That is not how democracies work. And yet that is the route that we're going down and because we're choosing not to deal with the unfunded promises of the future. When it comes to health, when it comes to super, these are not policies that New Zealand can in good faith 
continue and not have generational differences. We know that it's entirely unfair on future generations because boomers are the last generation who will be able to afford to pay for it themselves. Because of what has happened with house prices, because of what has happened in terms of wealth, they were the last generation to really reap the benefits of that. Every other generation that comes from now is going to really struggle relative to them. And all the evidence from international markets is that pretty much those born in the 1980s, well, 1980 was the last generation that, that had a greater than half chance of being better off than their parents. From now on, all those kids born after 1980 have less than a 50% chance of being better off than their parents. That's the kind of generational inequality that we're talking about, and those things are not going to go anytime soon. And yet we know the demographics, the, the voting patterns are going to diverge more and more, and we're going to see more of this kind of polarization when it comes to the inequalities of entitlements and what connection people feel to New Zealand. I really worry about this because this is going to be a really big part of those divisions for New Zealand. The divisions and the issues that I see for New Zealand when it comes to the inequalities, first for me is very much around zombie towns. It is around the big difference between the regions and the urban centres and the fact that we don't have active policies to try and make sure that just because you're born in a particular place doesn't mean you're going to be consigned to a life of, relatively speaking, hopelessness. Unless you come from a wealthy family from most of the provinces, you're trapped in those places, and I struggle with that. And when I look at, for example, very recently in the last 10 years, if you look at the jobs that have been created in New Zealand, almost all of it has been in either Auckland or Canterbury. The rest of the country has battled over no jobs. Right? That's, that's the recovery that they've experienced. And so when you go to many of these places, I'm not surprised when people say, what recovery? And they feel angry because they see that what's happening is Auckland and Wellington is having the problems with not having enough rental houses, not having enough infrastructure, and they're going, but we don't have enough population growth, we don't have enough economic growth, we don't have enough opportunities for the people who want to stay in my community. That is one of the biggest and starkest inequalities that exist in New Zealand today and is not going to go anytime soon. I think it's going to really lead to a big uh, political kind of standoff, particularly on the issue of immigration. Because instead of dealing with a lot of those other quite difficult issues, we have, foc we have used immigration as a shorthand to take the pressure valve off. Right? So every industry in New Zealand reports they don't have enough skilled people. But we don't train them. We don't educate them. We don't train them. We don't do anything to fix that problem. What we do is we use immigration to bring people in to fill that gap. And that's fine as a shorthand and for a short period of time but not fine for that to be the structure of policies, that everything will be fine because somebody out in the world is training the people that we need. Especially when you put it in the context of us not having built enough houses for a number of decades, and the context of not having invested enough in infrastructure for a number of decades, pretty much the period in the 90, 80s and 90s, we didn't build enough infrastructure. So it's not surprising that we have congestion in lots of places now because we are catching up with that neglect over that period of time. So when I see the stories about immigration, when I see the political reaction to this, it is that feeling of inequality that somehow, as citizens, as locals, why is it that we have to bring people in to take away something from me? Because that's what people feel like. When there's a newcomer in your country or your city, it feels like they're taking the space on the road that you should have. And this division is not good because the social license that we operate with to have this kind of immigration is fading. And we have no plan to deal with the uh, skill shortages, our weaknesses in the education system, our weaknesses in career planning to deal with those kinds of things. Housing, of course, um, is a real um, passion topic for me, only because I think this signifies and summarizes so much of the failings in terms of social policy. So much of New, in New Zealand, so much of New Zealand is kind of tied up in housing, right? So our culture is so much tied up in housing that dream of that, you know, little slice of paradise and all that kind of stuff. But all from a more practical perspective, buying a house is how you get security, how you get to live in one community, how you get to send your kids to one school, how you don't move around over and over again, how you save for your retirement, how you start a business. All of these ideas are tied around your house. And yet we know that fewer and fewer people are owning their own house. Homeownership in New Zealand pretty much rose from the post-war era until 91, and since then has been falling, and today is the lowest level since 1956. We have given up decades and decades of progress that was hard-worn in a very short period of time. So when I look at housing, I know that this is going to be one of the biggest issues in terms of inequalities that face people. Whether you're a renter or owner really matters, 
because whether you're going to be financially secure, socially secure, emotionally secure, quite often in New Zealand is built around the idea of having your own home. And yet we know that fewer and fewer people will be able to achieve that. So when I look at this, I know that this is going to be one of the biggest challenges and housing policy has to be at the pinnacle of the kinds of things that we have to deal with. <clears throat> but when I look at what, what we have done, and we talked about this before, but when I look at what we have done with some of our policies in terms of the active interest we take to try and bridge these gaps, we haven't done much. And I would describe the last 30 years as a period of neglect. When you look at our social housing stock, for example, which is in the blue line, you'll see, or sorry, in the gray line, you'll see that 91 was the peak. And since then, it's kind of had a few cycles depending on who's in power, but it doesn't really matter who's in power. In net, we have fewer state houses today than we did in 1991. On a per capita basis, we have the lowest number of social state houses since 1948. They built more within the first decade of the state housing program than what we have today. It's an embarrassment. But it also signifies the way that we think about social policy, the way we think about looking after people who are not fortunate enough to be able to have their own home or to be able to access secure housing. We don't want to look after them. That's what this tells me. It tells me that we have chosen not to look after people. Underne underneath all of this is a political choice that we have made for the last 30 years to neglect the poor and vulnerable in New Zealand. And I think that's where the biggest challenges in terms of why we haven't been able to deal with the issues that have been apparent for a long time. The stuff that I'm talking about is not new. If you go back through time and read the reports and read the newspapers, these are perennial issues because the drivers haven't changed. But what has changed is our unwillingness to respond. There is an election coming up, and I'd like to tell you that it doesn't matter who's in power because they all do the same kind of stuff. And this is essentially in the blue lines is how much they spend if they're spending up, and red lines if they're spending down. When you average it out across terms, whether it's a blue government or a red government, the average is much the same. It does not matter. In opposition, everybody shouts, oh, we won't let that happen. We're going to change that. We're going to fix that. They don't do any of those things when they come into power. Don't worry about who is in power. Worry about the values. Worry about the policies that we can influence inside the public organizations, because the reality is we have to make real changes in the way that we do public policy. The politics, by and large, is ineffective and is not that different between who's there. I recall um, <clears throat> John Key stating very strongly how there was a housing crisis when he was in opposition, but it only became a challenge when he was in power. And now there is no crisis or, or even a challenge now because affordability apparently is in the eye of the beholder. So, you know, I struggle with the idea that somehow choosing one party over another is going to make much of a difference. I don't think that's where it's at. In many ways, I think what's missing is our collective willingness to really engage in the ideas and our collective unwillingness to actually have empathy for people who are worse off than us. And therein lies, I think, the biggest challenge for all of us as citizens. So I know, um, you, Amy, you asked me to talk about um, inequality, but I'm going to talk a little bit about politics because... I think that's how we make change. And these two quotes really affected me. I use this all the time only because I think it really signifies, for the first one around how we do politics today at the most extreme version. And it's around the idea of um, acceptance by the communities. And populism and um, Abraham Lincoln's quote, in this and like communities, public sentiment is everything. With public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. We have taken it to the most extreme version of that where we do politics by polling. We will give you what the public wants week by week. But you know what? The public doesn't know what's needed for New Zealand in the long term. The public doesn't know the complex policy choices and trade-offs and decisions we must make. And what that requires is, in fact, leadership. We've been in a leadership vacuum for a number of decades, and I see no change in that over the next little while. Instead, I think we need a grassroots movement around activism and urgency. And I like this Martin Luther King because I think it really kind of captures what I want to see. It's the urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to take make real the promises of democracy. And the promise of democracy is that it's fair for everybody, including future generations. We have failed in that. I hope I have shown you with my presentation today that on so many parts of our community, we've got these gaps that have been there for a long period of time. Some of them are intensifying, and I, saw, I see no real progress being made to get on top of it. 
So when I think about inequality in New Zealand, I think we should start from the consequences. The consequences is that New Zealand is now a very polarized society. We're not that different from what they're seeing in places like the US and the UK. We have the same kinds of issues. It might look a little bit different, but a local flavor on the same kind of uh, big challenge. The political change that they're getting in the US and the UK might be good or not, I don't know. But we know that the reason why that has happened is because of the economic changes of the last 30 or 40 years, where, and we haven't taken the initiative to try, try and deal with that in terms of public policy. For me, the biggest sources of concerns, sources and concerns are, of that inequality are around regional differences. We don't talk about that enough. I absolutely must stress that unless you get around to different parts of New Zealand, you will not know what poverty is in New Zealand. There is real poverty in New Zealand. I have been to places where people have burnt their floors to keep warm in winter. This is a third world country in some, pl some places. Immigration is going to be a massive issue because we have used it as a bridge, as a filler against the inequalities that we see today. We have chosen not to invest in people, in education, in welfare, in terms of all of those bits and pieces. We've used this as a shorthand to top up. And I don't think that's going to work for much longer because the social license to have immigrants come in to fix those, to fill those gaps is disappearing. Housing is absolutely one of the biggest drivers of inequality. That's what drives a lot of the insecurity, a lot of the long-term insecurities that, uh, that build up in people. That is the biggest source of increasing inequality in New Zealand over the last 30 years. Even though income inequality has been stable, when you add in housing costs and access to housing, the inequality has in fact grown between the landed gentry versus generation rent. And therein lies one of the biggest challenges. It's a meta problem because we have failed so fundamentally on so many different parts of housing policy. I'd argue that it's not the technical policies that's the problem. And I said this at the community housing conference a couple of weeks ago. We kind of know what we need to do. We just don't want to because we don't care. And it may not apply to you as individuals, but I think as society there is something fundamentally wrong when we're not voting with an idea of empathy at the core of it. We are vo voting very selfishly for ourselves and for our own whanau. Without this empathy, I don't know how we're going to change things. And all I can say is that the inequality that we, s we see today can only increase if we don't have the empathy to want to make those changes. And the only way we're going to make these changes, I think, is around political engagement, but it has to be around grassroots movements. And it is about you all as individuals exercising your right to vote. Be engaged. Vote for your values. I don't care which political party you vote for. Go and talk to your local MP. How many of you talk to your local MP? Show of hands. Embarrassing. It really is. Right? We don't engage enough because we don't have time. We're busy people. But at the same time, we know that we are the ones who are educated. We are the ones who see New Zealand in many different facets. If we're not engaged, who's going to be engaged? We have to take personal responsibility to engage with politics because the reality is the issues that we see, and you'll see different facets in your work and in your daily lives. We have to be engaged because if the politicians don't know we want this change, they're not going to make any change. So on that rather depressing note, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so, so much. Um, we've got a bit of time for questions. So should we um, open the floor up? Um, so I was wondering if you had any um, international examples in terms of social housing or intersectional equity that you think would work in New Zealand? Yeah, so I'm probably not the best person. There's somebody here from Community Housing Aotearoa <laughs> who might be much better off. Um, there are lots of examples, so, but we don't need to go international to find an example of what works. We have a Housing New Zealand example in New Zealand that is completely local and was completely successful. It didn't cover it for everybody, but we know that we have the ability to use Housing New Zealand to significantly increase the social housing stock if we want to, but we choose not to. I think that's the first big one. That's, always go that's going to have the biggest impact because it's got the biggest balance sheet, it's got the biggest stock of land, it's the one that's best placed to make immediate and sustained impact. The second is around, of course, around the community housing sector, but they're really starved for capital. Very difficult for them to scale up from their relatively modest um, scale now. But they can play a very important part, particularly around things like shared equity, around secure rentals, and also being complementary to the state sector. And then we've got all the other models like cooperative housing and those kinds of things, which are very important and big parts of the housing market in places like Europe. But I don't think we have the social license yet to go down that path. So there are some really good examples, but those are long-term strategies. For me, 
social housing through, through Housing New Zealand is the first big t policy tool, and the second is around mainly through capital grants for community housing sector for them to scale up. Really? Thanks for that. Um, you started out by saying that the dispossessed are the majority of voters, at least internationally, but the same doesn't seem to be happening here in New Zealand. No. Why? I don't know. I really don't know. So in terms of the population, yes, the dispossessed are the majority. So if you think about the rural versus urban, if you think of renter versus uh, uh, homeowners in terms of individuals, uh, very much uh, the big gap. But voter turnout and voter engagement is very, very low, particularly amongst young people and poor people and disengaged people. And there is this kind of this almost this trap of people feel hopeless that my vote is not going to make any difference. It's the same old folk doing the same old stuff. And I don't know if we're going to see a change, but what we saw in the UK and the US is those people who felt angry and left out did vote. So at some point in time, the anger gets so much that you do some things. All you need is a firebrand to, to give you that, that avenue. Right now, I don't see an avenue in New Zealand to actually express your anger. You know, we're choosing between bland and blander, right? Mm -hmm. Well, speaking as a voter, that's what I see. I see two, well, real, realistically, we're choosing between two parties and two leaders who don't inspire me at all. <laughs> There's more than three. <laughs> Madam. You were saying that you were talking about having a firebrand to do yes. change. And then, so one of the things about the firebrand is there are key messages or very strong, very simple, yes. often not even correct <laughs> yes. messages. It mean lies, so yes. About, in terms of equity, there are some simple messages or there's some key messages and things that we should repeat and repeat and repeat until everyone knows it's true. Mm. So what are they? Well, for me, it is very much around regional inequality and housing inequality. Those are the two things that I think people can really grasp because they can see it in the communities, right? They can see that my region is worse off than a neighboring region. People can see that if you're a renter, you're much worse off than if you're a homeowner. And I think those are the two big messages that are really easy. I don't want us to go down the path of generational differences because I think that sows seeds of a generational war, which is not helpful. Because if anything, what we will see is it will be the boomers who will change their mind and actually grow a conscience and vote in the right way. That's going to make the big change. That's, that's my expectation, that that is where that empathy is going to come from. It is going to be amongst the baby boomers because they can see what impact of this, this 30 years of neglect is having on their kids and their grandkids. Sir. I was just wondering what your thoughts are on the election cycle, you know, it being only three years. Yeah. Is it possible for any party to come in and make fundamental change, you know, as, as sweeping as you're suggesting that we need to make? Yes. Um, when in reality it's maybe 18 months in power and if you're like campaigning it. around wanting to be re elected, so you've, you've really got kind of just soft policies to make sure that you stay in power. Do we need to change that? And if so, perhaps what to? Yeah, that's a good question. And in terms of the electoral term, if I had it my way, it'd be more like five years. I think you need to have three years in the middle to actually do stuff and see if it's working or not. Um, you know, we, we, have, we do policies in New Zealand that are untested and, you know, almost we don't even do the analysis afterwards to see if it worked. Uh, so I worry about that because if you had time, you would pilot and do all of those kinds of things. So in the absence of doing that, I think the most important thing is to take out the politics from it. So if there is an issue where the technical solutions are available, make it non-ideological. If we can take the political heat out of it and get consensus from the public, we know that we do politics by polling. So if the polls are in favor of a particular policy, if we can inform them, if we can get people behind it, then it becomes an apolitical issue. And that gives it the longevity that's required to make those changes. Personally, I think that's a much more likely path that's going to be successful. If we can make issues apolitical, if we can depoliticize it by appealing to evidence, appealing to, I guess, a broad cross-section of society, it's hard to do. It takes time. But the alternative is no change. So I'd rather we engage in constructive conversation with the public to change the public's mind, because I think that takes the political aspect out of it. on um, universal income or universal benefits? It's always a dangerous, dangerous question to ask of me because <laughs> I have views on everything. They're not, <laughs> they're not necessarily very well-informed well or accurate comments. So with the universal basic income, I think, as an idea, it's beautiful. And it's essentially a wet dream for economists. <laughs> but the problem is it's not practical. The problem is it's not practical because what you need is the social license to collect a lot of taxes from everybody. In New Zealand, we want small government and a large government at the same time. Those two things don't work. The reality is that 
we already grudge the relatively low rates of tax that we pay. Can you imagine us paying double this to have a universal basic income scheme? As a as a judgment on New Zealand as a populace, do you think it's going to fly? So when they had the referendum in Switzerland, it didn't pass. So lots of other places where they have much greater social cohesion than New Zealand does, they haven't been able to get it through because there is a requirement to first have a willingness to pay much more in taxes, and then you can talk about how you distribute it. But in New Zealand, we think that somehow because I pay more taxes, I deserve more back. It defeats the purpose of it. If I give it back to you, I may as well not have collected from you, <laughs> right? The whole. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So it's the whole idea in public policy is to really kind of you know, collect from those who can afford it well. That's the way we have a progressive tax policy. So then we can redistribute to those who need it. So I really struggle with that idea. I think a much more likely pathway is to have a more generous benefit system. Um, that would be much better. I think our benefit system has done a relatively good job in terms of a safety net, but it hasn't done a good job of poverty alleviation. And I think that's where a lot of the focus has to be. So the universal basic income is a great idea, and I think from a theoretical perspective would be really nice. But I, especially given the very volatile work nature we're going to see, the way how quickly our skills will become obsolete, all of those things would actually argue for it. But I think from a political perspective, we're a long way from that. So I would rather we focused on the policies that we already have today that we can strengthen to deal with those changes. And I think that is to make sure our welfare policy is more generous, not mean and grudging as it is at the moment, and take away some of the conditions that go with it, because that makes it really hard, but also invest significantly in our education system. I think that's one of the key barriers for us to give that income mobility that's been missing in New Zealand. Adam? Because this is um, family planning, do you have any comments on uh, population and family size and um, well, the size of the population generally, sometimes you hear we've got to um, have more because that will improve the economy. Can you just make a few comments on that? Okay. So I'm really straying into your ex areas of expertise, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm feeling very nervous right now. <laughs> So we know that fertility rates have been dropping as they have in every other advanced economy with rising incomes, right? And with you know contraception, more information, education, all of those things. Um, from a very personal perspective, I worry that we're having kids too late because you know there are some real biological reasons we had a lot of trouble having kids, and you know it makes life very very stressful when you're going down that path. So there are some things we're not doing right in terms of actually making it easy for people to have families. Right? Our workplace practices suck. Our uh, maternity cover, paternity cover is shit, right? And I'm sure that's a te technical term. <laughs> so I, I quit my job because it was better to be a contractor so then I could have time to be a parent rather than work the number of hours that you would in a kind of job that I had where I would never really see my son. What's the point? Why have kids? So I think modern, modern life has kind of moved, pushed us in this area where actually having kids is really hard. And so it's not surprising that we're not having that many kids. Whether or not um, we should be having more kids, it's a very personal decision, right? So it is, it's your body, it's your family, you decide what you want to do. From a population perspective, New Zealand is not full up. We can be much, much bigger if we want to be, and we can choose how it goes. But the reality is that from a demographic perspective, we will never grow our population in the long term with just babies, because we're too old now. We've lost that chance, we can't do that anyway. Um, so that's why we have immigration, and that's why we, we can, New Zealand can use the policy lever to kind of grow. What I have seen in terms of, um, the, I guess, the patterns of household size is um, because of an aging population, household size is falling quite a lot. Um, it used to be you know, over three, uh, well, over four in the 1950s to now about 2.7 on average across the country. Um, in places like Gisborne, most people, are, um, the biggest growth in households is one, one single person households, lots of lonely old people. And, what we're seeing is this kind of this divergence between we still think that everybody's going to live in a three-bedroom house, so we're still building for the families of the past, but in reality the kinds of population that we have is older people living alone, or even younger people who are more likely to stay alone for a longer period of time. So I don't know where to go with this in terms of the, uh, the family planning side of things because I think ultimately the only message I can give is if you want to have a family, just make sure that you do it at a time when it's biologically possible. 
because our work-life uh, balances and choices that we're making is making it really hard for people to have it at the right place. And we would do much better to change the way that we work, the, ch the way change the way that we have um, significant barriers for progress for women in, in employment. Wellington does better than most places, actually. Um, and the government does much better than the private sector. But also, we don't allow people to be parents. So, you know, I don't think it's just about having babies. It's more about thinking about how do you actually raise families. Um, I don't think it's constructive to have kids if you're not going to spend time with them. Um, I really worry about that because I've got friends who've got million dollar mortgages and they work every living hour, right? And I don't know how they're going to be good parents. So I know it's a bit of a shambolic answer, I guess, uh, relative to your qu question. But my very, very, very personal perspective is that if you want to have a family, do it young. Do it while you have the ability to take the shocks that come with being a parent. But we have to work much harder on the related policies around maternity leave, paternity leave, a more social approach, more community approach to supporting families, having workplaces that are actually supportive in terms of providing childcare, flexible working hours, all of those bits and pieces. Those are still not there. You would think we would have gotten there by now. We gave the women the vote, the first country in the world to do that, and we still haven't figured this stuff out. So I'm going to ask the last question because I want to. Know. <laughs> <laughs> we have three minutes left. And um, what were the what was the kind of social discourse and the, the kind of forces at play that that made that post-war you know kind of social policy happen? Like what what, was, what do we what do we need to emulate? <laughs> Yeah, I'm not, an, I'm not a historian or anthropologist, but my research of that era was there was just kind of this realization that those kinds of divisions that led to war were extraordinarily caustic. People saw the consequences in real terms. It was their, their dads and brothers and uncles who died in the war, and their families in Europe who got massively affected. And there was a sense of crisis that we must do something much better. There was a lot, I think there was a lot of goodwill that came as a, as a reaction to the horrors of war. Um, I don't think we, need, we should probably have a war to kind of endanger those feelings again, but it is the sense of crisis that galvanizes people and unites people to kind of make change. And I think that's what's missing. I think that's, that's what really characterized that period. And there was a strength of character in terms of we're in this together and we want to do this. So there was a massive social license to try a whole bunch of things. It wasn't well identified, well defined, but it was this idea, it was a value system that we want to invest in New Zealand. We want to make New Zealand a better place. We are ambitious about New Zealand. Um, that's, not the, that's not the framing that I get in political discourse now. It's much more incremental, much more gradual. But I think there was a sense of blue skies thinking and, and willingness to invest for future generations. Well, please, oh, yeah, do you want to? Yeah, I just want to, sorry, Chloe. No, I've got you. about 100 questions, but I've been trying to be mature. <laughs> 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 Look, oh, that's been fantastic, and I think one of the things that I've really, really taken away from me is that, that you were talking about empathy, and I've been struggling with that because I've had lots of conversations with lots of people over recent times because as an organisation we're really focused on equity and we're trying to look at how we can have those conversations and get people to really understand what we're talking about. And I'm constantly surprised from some very nice people who are very well informed and well educated cannot still appreciate the differences between the opportunities you have as a child and where you're born and what happens to you in education and how that impacts on your ability to earn money. And I, anyway, it hasn't resolved it for me, but I like, um, I really think that describing that empathy is something that I think as organisations, certainly as family planning, we have to keep on working on how we do that and how we can contribute to that conversation because we know it does make a difference and we certainly know for women in terms of their ability to manage their lives and their futures, the basic choice of being able, you know, when you choose to have a child is incredibly, you know, one very small right to have, and we still even struggle with that in New Zealand. So, um, sorry, I'm getting distracted on my issues, but our issues, but I still think it's, they, it's incredibly relevant. So, we re I really want to thank you heaps. It's really given, certainly given me a personal shot in the arm again, to and a lot to have a think about how we do those conversations and what we can do as organisations and as communities to contribute and how do we ever get a government... You know, a quick story about a poll, someone, there's another party which we won't talk about, who talks about wanting to have a poll for every decision and I was at a meeting and said very carefully that we vote people into government to make tough decisions, not to just poll and make, a, make the easy decisions, well, otherwise what's the point of you being there? 
why do we have to spend five million dollars to have a poll to make a decision? But anyway, so that's another story. You know, I stopped talking about story. We have got something small, but this is really more for your son, <laughs> not for you. Well, it is for you as well to enjoy. But we just wanted to say thank you very, very much, so and much. you're very generous to give your time. It's a pleasure. And um, I think we can do an awful lot to support and learn from the work that you do. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. There's a period if you want to have a wee quick nibble on the way out. There's a cracker there. And <laughs>